اقتربوا بارك الله فيكم اقتربوا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار The backdrop for today's lecture which comes to you in the form of a question is it shirk? is it polytheism? is it setting up partners with Allah as we who are being worshipped along with Allah comes as a result of the claim of some people who their understanding and their concept of Al-Islam and the Tawheed is diametrically opposed to the Islam and the pureness of a Tawheed that the Prophet brought Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam Is it shirk for the Muslim to make dua to other than Allah Azza wa Jal, period? But specifically, is it shirk for the Muslim to go to a grave, to a graveyard, a cemetery, and to make dua to people who are dead in the grave? Whether that dead person happens to be a prophet from the prophets of Islam, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in, or the dead person happens to be a wali from the awliya of Allah Azza wa Jal, or the individual is a saint, as they say, or a relative. Is that shirk or is it not shirk? When I was asked to put this issue on the table and to discuss it, I went to the internet <laughs> because there was a particular individual who's here in Birmingham who calls to the way of the Sufi Tariqa, of the Shistis. I listened to the talk that the person put across. And I was also amazed to a certain extent and shocked to see that on the page, is it shirk or grave worship in, in Islam? I was surprised to see that there were a lot of people who were making this claim. Even one of the people, he was an imam, I think he was doing the khutbah of al Juma because he was on the mimba. He spoke with an accent from the Caribbean, Trinidad or something like that. That's how his English sound. And he had actually had the nerve and the audacity to tell the community on what appeared to be the Friday khutbah that a salafiya is the most dangerous threat to al-Islam because evidently there were some people who were Salafi who were warning against making dua to dead people. So his understanding of Al-Islam, the understanding that he has of the Quran and the authentic Sunnah, is that it's permissible to make dua to the dead people in the grave. And if someone were to be opposed to that, then he's actually in opposition to the Haqq. And he's in opposition to the Deen of Allah and the Dawah, the Kitab and the Sunnah. And that's a bit disturbing. I'm not here to fight any of those individuals. So my objective, my goal, my niyyah is to poke them back in the eye. It's not my goal and my objective. 
my goal and my objective, inshallah ta'ala, is to try to be fair and just in dealing with this serious issue. This serious issue. This issue where the vast majority of Muslims in Birmingham who come from the Asian background, ethnic group, Africans and non-Africans, Arabs, a lot of Muslims understand that it is permissible to make dua to, to dead people. Although it's clear for the person, it's clear. And when I say that, I don't want anybody to be offended. I said in the khutbah al Jummah on Friday, there's not an Asian person in this masjid, not a single one in this masjid, and Allah knows best, except that he knows some people who make dua to people in the grave. There's not a single Asian here, except that that's the reality. So the vast majority of our masajid are like that. Masjid is not too far from here. Masjid al-Ghawth. Al-Ghawth comes from al-Istighatha. For a person to seek assistance. Al-Istighatha. To seek help from Allah. Al-Isti'ana. Al-Isti'ana. To seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Greatest surah of the Quran. Surah al-Fatiha. We just heard it two times. And we read it in the third raka'ah. Silently. And if you intentionally don't read that surah. You have to get up and pray again. You didn't pray. And in that, we ask Allah Ta'ala, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And in the authentic hadith, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said that Allah said, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةِ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي قسمين. I divided the salat, the recitation of the salat, into two parts. If my slave says, when he's making the salat, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allah says Hamadani Abdi my, my, my slave has praised me And if the slave says Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Athna alayya Abdi My slave has exalted me And if the slave says Rabbil Alameen If he says that Allah ta'ala says Majjadani Abdi My slave has made me majid. He has really given me the honor. And if my slave says, "Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in," Allah says, "Hada baini wa baina abdi wa li abdi masala." When the slave said, "Oh Allah, we worship you alone and we seek your assistance alone," Allah says, "This is between me and my slave, and I'm going to give my slave whatever he asks for. And what does he ask for? Ihdina surat al-mustaqim, surat al-ladina namta alayhi." All the way to the end. So Allah guides him to the Sirat al-Mustaqeen. When he understands, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ So an individual would take this ayat of the Qur'an and not bring a single proof from the tafsir of the companions or the tafsir of the tabi'een رضي الله عنهم أجمعين showing what they said. And what they said collectively was that the ayat clearly shows and it indicates the impermissibility of making dua to other than Allah. If the individual can come and he get the, the, gives the tafsir of that ayat in a way that's far into the tawheed that the Prophet brought sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So the first thing that we want to mention the khwani in dealing with this issue is that our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam he went through a lot in order to prevent the people from making shit with him. And to prevent the people from making dua to other than Allah Azza wa Jal, especially as it relates to the graves, especially, especially before he died, Salawatu Allahi Wasalamu Alayhi. Before he died, and everything that he said before he died, it deserves our attention even more because he's about to die. So he's telling the people things that they need to know because the time is close. So anytime you hear. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in his sickness and he said this and he said that he did this and it was close to his death. They know that he gave extra importance to that thing. He told the people Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his sickness, Lanatullah ala al-Yahudi wa nasara ittakhadu qabura anbiya masajid. May Allah curse the Jews and may he curse the Christians because they took the graves of their prophets as masjid. Masjid is the place where you come and you do sajda. You do ibadah to Allah. Why would the <laughs> Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam curse the people for doing something that's permissible? Go ahead and call on the Nabi 
if you want to because it's okay. He said, may Allah curse that individual. So when you as a Muslim see someone who's in opposition to that, if you have a problem with that, then you have to start off with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Our mother Aisha about this hadith, she said if the Nabi didn't say that, she said because he said that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we made his grave equal to the ground. Had he not said that, we would have put his grave up off of the ground. Ali radiallahu anhu, during the time of his khilafah, he had someone who was working for him in his administration. And he wanted to send that man on an errand in the land. He said to that man, shall I not send you to do something that the Prophet sent me to do? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That man who was in his administration said, yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, Allah tada'a qabran mushrifa illa sawwaita. Anytime you travel from here to all the way to where you're going, any grave that you come across that is above the ground, I want you to level it and make it equal and even with the ground. That's what the Prophet used to send me to do. Ali said, and also, if you come across any image, any picture, then deface it. Deface it. Why? Because through pictures, shit was introduced to Benny Adam. If you come across any idol, I want you to break their head off. Break it. Deface it. Why? Because through these idols, Benny Adam started making shit. Through these graves, people came and they started worshiping other than Allah. So the Nabi وسلم, went through great links in order to, great links in order not to allow this Ummah to make a shit by calling on other than Allah. So he cursed the Yahud and the Nasara. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was informed by our mother, our two mothers who had went to Ethiopia and they made the Hijrah to Ethiopia. And they saw that the kuffar of the Christians, they did all of this stuff with the graves and they were worshiping the graves of their prophets and their messengers. Um Salama radiallahu anha and the other wife of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. They said to the Nabi, you know, these people used to make these graves for their prophets and their messengers and they used to worship them. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qatil Allah and Yahudu wa Nasara. May Allah destroy them. In one hadith, he said, La'na to Allah. And he wasn't an individual who made La'na to Allah and people. Except that they deserved it. They were doing some serious stuff. In this hadith, in this hadith, he said, May Allah destroy those individuals. Destroy them. Because, again, it is having a person making the means and the ways to make shit with Allah. Now, many Muslims, our tasawwur, our comprehension, our understanding of Al-Islam is different from the understanding that the Prophet brought وسلم, and the companions had. There's the Muslim who will make tawaf around the grave. There's the Muslim who would go and he would make dua to the grave. But he doesn't see that as ibadah. He doesn't see that in his whole mind. He doesn't see that as worship at all. What he sees in his mind is it's the spectacle of death that I'm dealing with here. I'm asking the dead person because of their great position to ask Allah. I know that they can't do it. I don't believe in them. I'm asking them to go to Allah because of their position with Allah. And I say, that's from a shaitan. That's from a shaitan. And that's shirkun billah. And that's because you don't need any middleman to go between you and Allah, number one. And number two, that type of worship, to walk around the grave, dua, all of that stuff, there is no delil for it. As a matter of fact, the scholars of the past, when they saw those a hadith where the Nabi cursed these people, where the Nabi told us there's an etiquette that we have to have when we go to the graveyards, to the cemeteries. The Nabi told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the cemeteries, la tusallu ila al-qubur wa la tajlisu alayha. Don't pray towards the grave and don't sit on the graves. Don't sit on the grave because it's disrespect to the dead person who's in the grave. And they have rights on us even after death. Even after death. Once a Muslim dies, you have to wash him, you have to give him his shroud, you have to make salat over him. You have to take care of his estate. That's wajib upon you. When you visit him, he has the right that you give him salams. Just as you give the salams to the living, he has a right. Haqqul Muslim al-Muslim 6. Six rights. One of them, you have to give him salams. 
So don't sit on his grave. And don't pray towards the graves. You can pray inside of the graveyard. Salatul Janazah. And Nabi pray Salatul Janazah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inside of the graveyard. For a lady who used to clean the masjid when she died, they prayed Janazah on her in the masjid. And then they took and they buried her. The Nabi said, where is that lady? They said, she died yesterday, Ya Rasulullah. We made Janazah on, on her. He said, why didn't you tell me about it? Let's go. And he took him and he made the second Salat al-Janazah when she was in her grave. But he didn't pray towards the graves with the near, the goal and the objective to do that. The point is, most scholars of Islam, like Al-Imam Malik, he used to tell the people, when you go to Al-Madina and you find yourself in Al-Madina, and you want to give salams to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can give salams from wherever you are, right here. Allah has malaika flying around. Their creation, their purpose, their wadifa, their job. When we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they take that salam to the Nabi and Allah Azza wa Jal gives him life in a way that Allah knows reality so that he hears that salam. But he can't respond back Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as you're going to see. But he can hear that salam. He can hear that. So if you go to Medina and you want to go and see what the grave looks like, and Imam Malik used to tell the people after saying Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh, Ya Rasulullah, and you say the same thing to his two companions, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. After that, and Imam Malik said, put the grave behind your back and make dua to Allah towards the Qibla. Don't you make your hands raised up like that and you're making dua to Allah and the grave is in front of you. He encouraged the people, he advised the people, get on the side, make the grave behind your back. Get to the right or the left of the grave and make dua to Allah wahduhu la sharika lahu. So is this from our religion? Now I know, ikhwani, as Allah mentioned in many ayat of the Quran with the Yehud and the Nasar and the Kufa of Quraysh, if you bring all of the ayat, some people are just not going to believe. Because that's the religion of their forefathers. And they're not going to change the religion of their forefathers. But I'm not concerned about that. What I want to do is, inshallah ta'ala, help you to understand this simple, easy issue. The middle course in this issue. The middle course. And it's not complicated at all. When I listened to the talk of this particular teacher, I was amazed. Because he was saying things that we don't disagree with. He took the ayah, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. You are the one we worship and you are the one we seek your assistance. And he wanted to show how in the Quran and the Sunnah, other people, you can seek their assistance. We don't have a problem with that. The Quran and the Sunnah allows us to make istighatha with other than Allah. The Quran and the Sunnah allows us to make isti'ana with other than Allah. The Quran and the Sunnah allows us to make the su'al, the mas'ala. You ask someone other than Allah. The religion allows us. So you don't have to bring all of those ayat and those ahadith. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about Musa and what happened with the man from Bani Israel. He was fighting one of the men from the Egyptians. And when Musa went by, the one from Bani Israel sought the assistance of Musa. And Allah used the word istighatha. فَاسْتَغَافُهُ الَّذِي مِنْ شِيَعْتِهِ عَلَى الَّذِي مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ And Allah used the word that the one who was from the group of Musa, the ethnic background of Musa, the jama of Musa, Musa is Hebrew. The other Hebrew, he made his stighatha, asking Musa, save me, save me. We believe this is permissible. Allah mentioned in the Quran, someone is in the war and he's drowning and he say, yo, save me, save me. You can say this is permissible, it's normal, natural. If you don't do that, something's wrong with you. So we believe in that. The brother is bringing all of these ayat. Cooperate with each other on a taqwa. We believe that. Allah told us to do that. Someone brought a camera. Someone put this microphone here. Someone is being the muqaddam to allow the speaker to speak. Someone brought me here in the car. We're cooperating on al birr wa taqwa. People were paying the rent and the paying the electricity bill, the water bill in the masjid. All of that is mutual cooperation. Isa ibn Maryam, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, he said to Bani Israel with him, who's going to be from the Ansar of Allah? The Ansar of Allah, who's going to help me to spread the religion? Now if I wanted to misconstrue ayahs, I could take that ayah and say, 
So Allah needs help. Allah needs help. But everyone knows what the ayat is saying. It is saying that Isa ibn Maryam is asking the people, help the religion of Allah. Like the Prophet ﷺ came to Quraysh and he said to Quraysh and the companions, who will help me to spread the religion of my Lord? So the Nabi had Ansar ﷺ and he asked people, we don't have any problem with those ayat and those ahadith. Help your brother if he is oppressed or if he is the oppressor. The hadith said, help your brother. What's the problem? If he's being oppressed, get involved and stop the oppression. If he's doing the oppression, give him advice and try to help him to stop the oppression. Khwani, some things are so clear that when you try to explain them, you muck up the water. None of you truly believes until he loves to his brother what he loves to himself. So you want to explain what does that mean? None of you truly believes. Maybe that part it needs some explanation because someone may think that you are Catholic if you don't love for your brother. But when you come, someone, no one truly believes until you love for your brother. Well, the word love, let me explain. Yeah, love is too well known. Don't try to explain it or you're going to confuse it. Just leave it. Love is love. That's how you explain it. So these ayat and these issues, they're self-explanatory and we're not against them at all. But in order, in order to seek the istighafa, in order to seek the isti'ana, in order to make a su'al to someone, you only can do that with some conditions. And if you don't look at it like that, then you're making a problem. Because I agree, if you read certain ayat and you just take them by themselves, you'll be misunderstanding the religion. You have to read these ayat with the other ayat. <laughs> Allah told the Prophet sallallahu You don't guide and you can't guide those who you love. That's what Allah said in the Quran. So a person says the Nabi can't guide at all. He doesn't guide at all. And then the other ayah said, وَإِنَّكَ تَهْدِنَ سَرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ سَرَاطِ اللَّهِ Verily you do guide to the Surat al-Mustaqim. One ayah said you don't, the other one said you do. So we have to put them together and harmonize them with an explanation that's plausible. Many ayat of the Quran are like that. Those people believe the Jews, the Christians, the Sabi'een, those people believe in Allah on the last day and they do righteous work, they won't be afraid Yom al Qiyamah, they get the reward from Allah. Someone reads that ayat and comes and says, the Jews and the Christians are our brothers because of that ayat. No, there are other ayat that show the religion with Allah is Islam. So those ayat that were mentioned, we're totally for them. We're totally for them. But in order to make istighafa with someone else, in order to seek help from someone else, in order to make dua and ask someone to do something for you, there are conditions that have to be there. Three conditions. And if any one of these conditions are not there, you're making shirk with Allah. And before I do those three conditions, let me just say, before these three conditions, inshallah, you should know something. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Abdullah ibn Abbas, hey young man, if you ask, ask only of Allah. And if you make istiana, only make istiana from Allah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will take the bayat. The man, Awf ibn Malik, will come. He says, I want to accept Al-Islam. Would you take the bayat from me? The Prophet said, yes, I take the bayat from you. He used to take the bayat and mention different things to people. I take the bayat from you that you give nasiha to everybody who you meet. I take the bayat from you that you don't make shik with Allah. You don't kill your children. You don't steal. You don't commit zina. He would give the bayah and different things. On this particular occasion, Awf ibn Malik, the Prophet said, Bayatuka ala la tashkilan la tas'ala na shay'a. I give you the bayah that you shouldn't ask the people for anything. Don't ask for anything. Don't ask for a ride from point A to point B. Don't ask to borrow money. Don't ask someone to come to help you fix up your house. Don't ask for anything. So this man, Awf ibn Malik, well, get on his camel, get on his horse. He wants to ride. The thing that he makes the horse move with will fall out of his hand, the whip. 
the whip? He wouldn't say, Akhi Abu Ibrahim, can you pick it up and give it to me? He would get off of the thing and get back on his camel after picking it up. The man would say, all you had to do was ask me. He would say, I gave the bayah to Nabi, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not to ask people anything. Because if you don't ask people, if you don't ask them, they'll never be able to come back and say, don't you remember what I did for you? You owe me. You owe me. He did something for you. Now he says to you, hey, 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 I need a ride to London because my mother's coming, my sister's coming, my father, I need a ride to London. You say, but I got to work today. He said, but don't you remember what I did for you? And you feel that uneasiness that it wouldn't have been there if you never asked him in the first place. He asked you, can you take me to London? No. Okay, that's it. He doesn't owe you. You don't owe him when you don't ask people. Now, that doesn't mean it's haram to ask people. We need each other. We need each other. I know myself. I can't speak for any of you. I can't speak for any of you. If I didn't have Allah and then my wife to cook for me, I'd be in trouble. I need her to cook for me. Because if she wasn't there, I would be in trouble. Many of you are like that in other aspects of your life. So Islam is not saying... You can't ask people. Islam is saying you can only ask people when there are three conditions. Any one of them are gone, you are committing shirk with Allah. First condition. The first condition is you can seek someone's help, the assistance, and ask them when they have the ability to help you. If they have the human physical ability, if they don't have the ability and you were to ask them for something they don't, it's beyond their ability. You're making shirk. You're making shirk billah. Allah Azawajal mentioned in the Quran, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا عِنْدَنَا خِزَائِنُهُ وَمَا نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدْرٍ مَعْلُومٍ There is nothing, nothing except that its proportion. The thing itself is with me, with my treasures. And I send it down according to what I want to send it down. So from Allah's treasures are the children that are on the face of the earth. Only Allah is going to send children to people and no one else. Al-Hidayah. Allah sends Al-Hidayah or guidance down. He gives it to some and he doesn't give it to other people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa can't guide anybody. Unless Allah allowed him to guide that individual. Someone wants... A baby, he can't ask someone else, help me to get a baby, make my wife have a baby, meaning you're going to do some dua, you're going to make it just happen. If you do that, you ask someone who doesn't have the ability, then you're making shit with Allah. I don't care who you want to ask. Yomul Qiyama, Allah said about Yomul Qiyama, La yastaktimuna sa'a. They can't make it come up and they can't delay it. All of Beni Adam, it's only in Allah's hands and that's it. That's the first one. Concerning this point, Ikhwani, there are many, many ayat of the Quran that deal with this in many ways. Many ways. We don't have the time just to deal with two of those ways. But we'll just bring one way to the table. That Allah mentioned consistently in the Quran, showing that if a person doesn't have the ability to do something and you call on them other than Allah, then you're committing shit. And he did it in this way by using the weakest creatures from the creation. By giving similar tools, al-amthal, examples. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, duriba mathurun fastami'u lahu. Inna al-nadheena tad'oona min duni Allahi lan yakhluqu dhubaba, walau ijtama'u lahu. Wa in yaslabhum al-dhubabu shay'a, la yastanqidhuhu minhu. Da'uf al-talibu wal-matloob. Look at this example. The eloquence of the Quran, O mankind, not just Muslims, all mankind, a similar tool, an example has been given to you. Listen to it. Verily those who you call on other than Allah, they can't create a fly. And if they all came together to create the fly, they never would be able to do so. And if this fly were to take something from them, they wouldn't be able to get it back, whatever the fly took for them. Allah said, the fly is weak, and the ones who are trying to do something to or with the fly, they're also weak. So it goes to show. Goes to show. The fly, as a creature, is nasty. He's always flying around nasty stuff. He comes and he puts his feet and his body on your food. Wherever he was at, you're eating that stuff. And you can't stop him from coming. 
He goes on your nose. You can't do anything about it if Allah didn't want it to happen. Allah said, those who you call on other than Allah, other than Allah, you're weaker than this. All of us in this room tried to come together to put that flag together. We wouldn't be able to create them. And if he took something from us, you wouldn't be able to take it. Allah, Allah has the ability for the fly to take my hat and fly around with my hat. Allah has that ability. If it were to happen, as a Muslim, we don't see that as impossible. We wouldn't be able to get that hat back from that fly collectively in this room. So how are you going to worship other than Allah? I don't know, Khwani Wallahi, what is it that's so difficult for a Muslim to just be with the easy Tawheed? He opens up the bottle and easily, without choking, it just goes down easy. It's just the fitrah. Why do we have to insist on a shirk? Another example of how if you call on other than Allah for help, for assistance, and he doesn't have the ability to help, you're making shirk. Another example that Allah Ta'ala gave from another weak creature. Allah Ta'ala mentioned مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ يَدْرُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَاء كَمَثُلُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتَ وَإِنَّ أَوْهَنَ الْبُيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Those people who call on other than Allah and they take other people as protectors and awliya with Allah they call on other than Allah and they take helpers other than Allah Allah said their example is like the spider who made his house with the spider web. Allah said the weakest house is the house of the spider web. Only if they knew. Who in his right mind, in his right mind, is going to go and take some spider webs, put his money in the drawer in his house, and take spider webs and put the spider web around the drawer to protect the drawer and to lock the drawer from opening where someone can come and take his money? No one. That's Allah's way of telling the Kufab Quraysh what you're calling on cannot help you. It cannot help you. Look at the ayat. If Allah wants good for you, if Allah wants bad for you, he wants to touch you with evil. Someone's going to get cancer. Someone's mother's going to die. Someone is going to lose his limb. Someone is going to lose his job. Whatever you can think of. Allah said, if Allah wants some harm to touch you, there is no one who can push that harm away except Allah. And if Allah wants good to touch you, there is no one who can prevent that good from his father, he gives it to whoever he wants to give from his servants. So the Nabi told Abdullah ibn Abbas, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu anhu, he said, Ibn Abbas, listen, listen, no. If the jinn and the mankind that came together to help you or to harm you, they wouldn't be able to do so unless Allah allowed it. So if you want to make istighatha like the man made with Musa, you can make istighatha, you can make isti'ana, but he has to have the ability. He has to be able to help you. Number two, if he can't help you, you're making shirk. Asking the Nabi right now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, help me to get married. You're making shirk. Number two, the one who you're asking, he has to be from the living. He can't be from the dead. If he's from the living, you can ask him because he's alive. But if he's dead and you ask him, you're making shirk based upon the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, all of those ayat help each other, istighatha, isti'ana, the su'al, the mas'ala, no problem, no problem. But he has to be alive. He has to be on the face of the earth with life in him. Not the hayat of the barzakh, the hayat of dunya, because of the ayat of the Quran. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in one of the many ayat, وَالَّذِينَ تَدُعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِنْ قِتْمِيرِ إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَسْتَجَابُ لَكُمْ وَيَوْمُ الْقِيَامَ يَكْفِرُونَ بِالشِّرْكِكُمْ وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خَبِيرِ Listen to the ayah. Those people you people are calling on other than Allah, 
those people you're calling on, making dua to other than Allah, they don't possess the ability to do anything. Katmir is the date, the seed of the date that you pull out, that little string. They don't even, they don't even have that much. They can't pull it off of the date. They can't put it back on the date. They can't help you. They can't help themselves. The ayah said, if you call on them, they can't hear you. And if they have the ability to hear you, they won't answer your dua. And your muqiyama, they're going to free themselves from you and your shirk. They're going to free yourselves. So look, people in the grave right now, they can't hear us. Sometimes they can hear. When they're going to be buried, they can hear the footsteps of the people walking away. So they can hear, but you can't say to them, yo, yo, what's going on down there? You are right down there, describe to me what's going on. You can't say that. And whatever they hear from you, they can't say anything back to you. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as I told you, he can hear sometimes. Can he hear everything? La Wallahi, he can't hear everything. Can't hear everything. He hears our salams, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he can't give salams back. He doesn't give salams back. And Yom al Qiyamah, those people who people call on other than Allah, they are going to free themselves from the shit that the people made. And that's why Allah puts forth a question. And it's not acceptable. This situation is serious. Look at the question that Allah Ta'ala puts forth. وَمَنْ أَدَّلُّ مِمَّنْ يَدْرُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مَنْ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ لَهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَهُمَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ وَإِذَا هُشِرَ النَّاسِ كَانُوا لَهُمْ أَعْدَاءٌ وَكَانُوا بِعِبَادَتِهِمْ كَافِرِينَ Who is more astray? Who is more astray from the Sirat al-Mustaqeen, from al-Islam, and from the Tawheed? Than the individual who calls on other than Allah. Other than Allah. And the one who he's calling on can't hear him until Yawm al-Qiyamah. And concerning his dua, the individual who's in the grave the one who's dead, he's not even aware of what the man is saying. Allah said, Yawm al-Qiyamah, when they gathers all of them together, the ones making dua, the ones in the grave, when they gather, when they're gathered all together, the ones who are in the grave are going to free themselves from the individuals who are making dua to them. So look at the double trouble that's going on, double jeopardy. You're making dua to someone who can't hear you and he can't help you until Yawm al-Qiyamah, number two, the one who you had hope in is going to come Yom Al-Qiyam and free himself from you. So if the individual is dead, dead, it's not permissible to call them for anything. But if they're alive, you can say, help me against them. Help me with that. Give me this. I'm seeking assistance with you. Help me against us. It's permissible. Number three and the last point, Khwani, he has to be able. He has to be alive. And he has to be present. Hadir. You know how these people say Hazir Nazir? Hadir means present. He has to be present right there. You can't be here in Alam Rock and he's in Timbuktu and you say, Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh. If you do that, you're making shit. Unless, unless he's on the telephone, you're connected on the telephone, you're on the Skype. No problem. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an individual that I had experience with after being a Muslim. Being on Christianity and coming into Al-Islam, the person comes into the door of Al-Islam only to open up the window and to jump out of the window on his head. What's the benefit of that? To travel all the way from America to a Sudan to look for some special sheikh who you're gonna make dua to? I'm discussing and debating. As a new Muslim, another brother who was much older than me and the debate and discussion became heated. If it kept going the way it was going, it could have led to violence. Because that's how upset he was. That's how upset I was. I'm a new Muslim, and you're not going to tell me that that sheikh can hear us right now. We're in Medini. We're in Medini, in Sudan, and the sheikh is in Darfur, 900 kilometers away. Over 900 miles away. In Sudan, in Khwani, like in Pakistan, in Mirpur, the lights go off every day. Every day. If you have a generator, you just start the generator up or you have a candle, you light the candle, that's it. As we were arguing and debating, the lights went off. He said, Allah, Allah, it's from the sheikh. It's from the sheikh. <laughs> I said to him, I don't say that to make you laugh. I said to him, and to kafir. You are kafir. He's the only person I made takfir of. 
It wasn't my job to make takfir of him. I want to untakfir him here today. It wasn't my job to make takfir of him. I'm a new Muslim. Who am I to make takfir? And for your information, one of the greatest scholars of Islam is an Imam Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Ali al-Shawkani, al-Shawkani from al Yemen. He used to be Shiite, he used to curse companions. He was affected by the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahumullah, and he got on the sunnah, and he became a scholar of an ijtihad, and he was against the taqlid and against the shirk. He said in the book that he wrote about different personalities, it's called al badr al He wrote in that book, he brings biographies of different scholars from the seventh century up until his time. He would write in that book, I want to take back my takvir that I made about people. Because he used to make takfir of people when he got on the sunnah. He used to write letters to the followers of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. After the death of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, they were tough on some issues. They would make takfir of people if you didn't put the grave down because of the delil. They were tough on Tawheed, serious about Tawheed. He would write them and say, don't make wholesale takfir of the Muslims like that. So if you make a mistake about some position, whatever, no problem. I want to in front of you people and Allah is my witness untakfir that man but what he was saying was kufr and I couldn't believe it you know that the electricity goes off multiple times in the day how in the world do you believe that the sheikh 900 miles away has something to do with that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran Allah knows what's in front of them and what's behind them and they don't know anything about what is muhit with Allah. The voices, the voices of the dunya, only Allah knows all of the voices. Only. Here you think that some other individual can hear you saying something. He's all the way over there in dead yab. And you're here. And you say, Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh. And you believe he can help you? That's shirkum billah. Shirk kufrum billah. He has to be present. Has to be present. Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, "Ma yakunu min najwa thalathatan illa huwa rabi'uhum, wala khamsatan illa huwa sadisuhum, wala adna aw akthar min dhalika, wa huwa ma'ahum ayna ma kanu." The najwa, najwa. Learn this word, inshallah, in your vocabulary, your Islamic Arabic vocabulary. A najwa, najwa, is secret meanings that the hypocrites used to have. The hypocrites, they used to come up with plots and plans against the Muslims and Islam. <laughs> so under the cover of the darkness of the night, two of them, three of them would come and they would be alone. And they would start making plots and plans, having nejwa, secret meetings. Allah said, these hypocrites never have a secret meeting, a nejwa. Except if they're three, Allah is the fourth. If they're five, Allah is the sixth. They never less than that, more than that, except that Allah is with them wherever they are. He hears, he sees. He's with them in his ability to hear. He's with them in his ability to see. He's with them in that his knowledge is encompassing everything. Only Allah is with everyone like that and hears everything. If you are an individual who makes dua to someone who is not here, you want to seek the assistance of someone who is not here, help me, help me. Help me, help me. Now, if the niyat, the niyat of the person is not to make istighatha, it's not to make istiana. She just says that. Something happens and she's oppressed or something and she says, you know, my father, my father. She's just saying that. Oh, my mother, oh, my, oh, my. She's not asking her mother to come and help her. It's just, I'm in a messed up situation and I'm weak and I need my father now and just... Just saying my father, my father, because he was always there to protect her and help her. So he, she says, just from the lisan, as the Arabs used to say, when something would happen, they would say, oh my father, oh my father, and different things. Fatima radiallahu anha, when the Nabi died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said that. She said, wa abata, wa abata. She said, my father, my father. How do you people allow yourselves to put dirt on the body of the Nabi? She was just distraught that with every piece of dirt that was being put on the grave, he is being buried. She didn't say, oh, my father, my father, I'm help, help me. She didn't mean it like that. And this is something that's from the tongue of Islam. 
The Muslims say, Wa Islama, Wa Islama, O oh Islam, O oh Islam, meaning Islam is being attacked from every corner. So the Arabs would say that as a form and a way of expressing yourself at that particular time. So those three conditions, Ikhwani, they're simple, they're easy. Let the world know. As people of the Sunnah, as people of the Sunni, inshallah, who want to practice religion according to the Salafiyya that the companions were upon, radiallahu anhum, ajma'in, we believe you can make istighatha, you can make isti'ana, you can make su'al, you can make dua, ask someone, dua, ask someone. You can do all of that. If the individual has the ability to help you, if the individual is alive, if the individual is present with you, or if he's far away, there's something connecting you, telephone, mobile phone, Skype, something like that, then there's no problem, no problem. As for any of these being absent, then you're committing shit. That's how simple and easy this topic is. It is the pure milk, the pure milk, pure, pure, the Halib Safi, that when you have a baby, you put that baby on the pure milk of the mother. You don't take that baby and give that baby pig's milk. Although, wallahi, pig's milk is better for the baby, better for the baby than to connect them to someone who's in a grave. Because although he may get sick with that pig's milk, and although the idea is nasty and it's messed up, what is worse, what is worse, is someone making shit with Allah. So we'll come up with things in our culture. Pig, pig's milk, pig, uh, pig's milk, pig's milk, pig's milk. Where does that come from? We do this because it comes from somewhere. We don't like the pig. All right. We should come up with something for shirk. Why isn't there something for shirk? When the word shirk is mentioned, something about shirk, something big. We should be doing something. No, because we have it kind of backwards. The pig, zina, khamr, all of these things are big. So we do different things. But when it comes to shirk, it's not so big. Although the shirk is the one issue that Allah is not going to forgive. Allah will tell you, and we finish with this. In that masajid that Allah, فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَ The masajid for Allah, for Allah, don't make any shirk with Allah. The Prophet being buried in his masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, happened after his life. And when it happened, there were those from the companions who made inkar against it. They weren't happy with it. But the leader did it, and all they can do is give advice. And they, radiallahu anhum, never went to that grave and made dua to the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened with the people of Al-Kaf, of the cave, making a grave to worship those people who were in that grave, and they wanted to do that? The religion of the people before us, their legislation is not a religion for us. When their religion goes against our religion, their legislation is rejected. Wala karama. So it's a simple issue. Ummat al-Islam, at-tawheed, at-tawheed. Be people who are simple on the sunnah. Be people who are simple on the sunnah. And don't be of the people who have to insist that we make shirk with Allah. As Allah described the kuffar, Quraysh. Wala dhukir Allahu wahdu shma azzat qulub al-ladhina la yu'minun bil akhirah. If Allah is mentioned by himself, worship Allah alone, they become enraged and angry and upset. But when those are mentioned other than Allah, along with Allah, lo and behold, they become happy. They become happy. Worship Allah la sharika lahu. We'll open up the floor, inshallah, for any questions that you brothers may have. And I want to repeat and reiterate what I mentioned a while ago. There are many dangerous groups in Al-Islam. They pose a danger to Muslims and non-Muslims. Many internal groups that are dangerous to Al-Islam. I believe, as Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, the single most dangerous group is not the Khawarij, the Muslims who believe you can blow this one up and kill this and make takfir and fight up. No. Shabab, you know, all of that stuff, Al-Qaeda. He said they're not the most dangerous because these people will hit you and kill you if they disagree with you. If they disagree with you, they will fight you and kill you. He said they're not the most dangerous. He said the most dangerous group are the Sufis. Not because they're bad people, but it's just what they believe in. 
not all Sufis believe, but from the beliefs of the Sufi is Al Hulul. Allah is everything, and everything is Allah. The dog is Allah, the pig is Allah. Not all of them believe, but this came to the Muslims through the Sufis. The Sufis believe, the Sufis believe that with enough dhikr, with enough dhikr, you can become Allah. With enough dhikr, you can transport yourself to another place. That's what they believe. Some of them believe in the taqdis of the ashkhas, making personalities muqaddisa. Above human, he's sitting on the axis of the world. He makes the world go round. He makes the dua. He answers the dua. You're the murid. You're the murid. Suspend your intellect and be a slave in front of the sheikh. La wallahi, I can't be the slave in front of my mother, my father, the sheikh, nobody. I have to be the Abdullah. Abdullah. I'm going to respect my sheikh big time. I'm going to respect my mother, my father big time. My uncles, my elders big time. But slave? La wallahi. I'm Abdullah. That's why it's the most, it's the most beloved name to Allah. Abdullah Abdurrahman. Sufism, Ikhwani. Not all Sufi. Sufism. It was the tariqah, the madhab. It was the jama'at that when the kuffar went into the Muslim lands, it was the Sufis who said, let's go to the Zawiya and just make dhikr and let them do what they want to do with their dunya. No jihad. We've got to make jihad of ourselves. Let them steal your water. Let them steal your land in the Muslim world. It was the Sufis telling Muslims these types of things. It doesn't mean, as Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, from the Sufis, are some who are religious and righteous. No doubt about that. They are religious and righteous. And they are better than a lot of people who are not Sufis. That's what he said. And we have to be fair about that. Some of them have akhlaq. Some of them have knowledge. Some of them have a zuhd. And so forth and so on. Not all of them are the same. But these ideas and these concepts that I'm giving to you right now came from these people. And worse than that. Other stuff other than that. Don't work. Just, just... Disconnect yourself from the dunya. And from them is this heinous crime, this terrible crime. Connecting the people to dead people. Connecting the ummah to dead people. Worshipping people in the grave is from the major sins. And it's the major sin, it's the major kufr that would take a person outside of the fold and the realm of, of Islam. May Allah Azza wa establish our feet on the Sirat al-Mustaqim and on the Kerim of a Tawheed and may He subhanahu wa ta'ala put us on the Aqeed of Ahlul Hadith the likes of Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum and those A'imma of Al-Islam those A'lam who came after them Wallahu A'la wa A'la What time is Sirat al-Insha? Quarter past Okay, Khwani, if you brothers have any questions concerning the lecture, inshallah, you can put your question forward. Ayyuh Abu Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu The Sufis, they use the, <coughs> they use the fact of the, uh, the various narrations of the companions who seek blessings from the items of the Prophet, alayhi And they would, <coughs> you know, uh, wash themselves, etc., or, or seek blessings from the items that belong to the Messenger, alayhi And they will then say that when we go to the tombs of the dead, because they are close to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa sends down blessings down upon that tomb, that's why we take the dust, we take the dirt back home with us, etc., rub it on ourselves, etc. How do we counter? It's a good question, it's an intelligent question, it's a shubha that these people have. It is a fact that, khwani, that we have this issue, I told you the word Najwa. Ahi Abu Yusuf, what is Najwa? Secret meetings. Huh? Secret meetings. Secret meetings. Good job. There's another word I want to bring to your attention. At-tabarruk from al-baraka. At-tabarruk. At-tabarruk. I'm going to say it. I want you to say it. At-tabarruk. Come on, everybody got to say it. We're going to make a Sufi dhikr. At-tabarruk. No, it's a serious issue. It's serious. It's serious. At-tabarruk, ikhwani, is the process of seeking baraka. This is from our religion, and the Sunni don't reject this. The companions, radiallahu anhum, made a tabarruk from the Prophet's person and from his athar, his effects. He makes wudu, they take the wudu and put it on themselves. They take his sweat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and put it in the qarura, and they use it for itr, for their children on Friday. 
They did that. The Prophet would perform Hajj Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would cut his hair. The Nabi would take his hair and give it to him and give it to him and give it to him and give it to him. And then he in turn, when the Tabi'een came, he would give it to the Tabi'een and they were holding on to that. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daughter Zainab died. They washed the body, put up braids and three braids. The Prophet came to the grave and said, which one of you men did not have relations with your wife yesterday? He said, me, he said, me. The Prophet said, okay, you get in, you put in the grave. He took off one of, piece of his cloth, clothing and said, bury this with her. For tabarruk, the munafiq, the chief of the munafiq, he came, he came to the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they wanted the Prophet to pray over him. For tabarruk, his son came, his son came and said, pray over my father, pray over my father. For tabarruk, a man saw that someone gave the Nabi a nice thobe, a shirt, nice. This man knew the Nabi never says no. That man said, hey, Ya Rasulullah, can I have your shirt? He needed it. The Prophet gave it to him. The Prophet left. The people came and said, yo, why did you do that? You knew he needed it. And you knew he wasn't going to tell you no. The man said, well, I didn't need it. I didn't ask for it because I need it. I just want to be buried in it. So the companions did a tabarruk with his spit, with his sweat, and with his clothes. As for a tabarruk with his urine, not authentic that the lady drank his urine is not authentic that they drank his blood some scholars said it's authentic but it appears it's not authentic Abdullah ibn Zubair is not authentic after he did it he jumped. so I tell you right now if there was a cup that's been handed down through the ages and that cup came into your possession and it was from the Nibi I say we're going to protect it and we're going to take it with honor and we're going to rub it with the Nabi because they only did it with him after him Abu Ibrahim not a single companion did that with Abu Bakr not a single one not a single one and they're from the Oliya. some of them had dua that was mustajab some of them had karamat used to happen at their hands not a single person came and did a tabarruk with a single companion after the Nabi so that's from his khasa it's only for him the second thing, Ikhwani, is we can get a tabarruk from the righteous people who are living. How? We get a tabarruk by coming to the class of the sheikh. And the mala'ika come down. And the sakina comes down. The knowledge that he's giving. The dua that he's making. We'll get tabarruk for that. We get a, we get a tabarruk from people in the, in the grave. And that, when we go to the grave, we ask Allah Azawajal, Ya Allah, this is your slave. They were really uh, this and that. And you're following the sunnah. As a result of following the sunnah in the ziyarah of the qubur, you get some blessings. As for picking up dirt, eating dirt, rolling around in the dirt, making tawaf, making dua, there's no delil for that. Barakallah fiqum. Ahi. Assalamu alaikum. Zakallah for your time, Ahi. Um, Say that there's a mosque which is next to you and they are known for doing shirk and you want to pray behind them, say for Salat al Fajr, because the other mosque will be far from you. Is that permissible or should you just stay away from it? People who are confronted with the problem of having a masjid where the Imam of that masjid is calling to shirk and kufr, it's a big problem. First of all, let me tell you, Khwani, from the asul of a salafiya that all of the all of the ulama put in the books that tell us about the minhaj al salafi, all of them, all of them. All of them, from the asul and the foundations and fundamentals of this religion is people of the Sunnah pray behind every single Muslim, no matter what his bid'ah is, as long as the bid'ah isn't one of a shirk, one that takes you out of Islam. If it's one that takes you out of Islam, then we don't pray behind those individuals. You don't pray in that masjid. You have an excuse not to pray in that masjid, even if it's right next door to you. You have an excuse. So if you know that that Imam, he believes in this stuff of kufr and shirk, you have an excuse with Allah Azza wa Jal. You have an excuse with Allah. You don't have to attend and don't worry about it. But it's not your job to go up to an Imam who you don't know his situation and say, hey, what do you believe? Don't test people like that. If you know with yaqeen, this is what they believe, then don't do it. Don't pray janazah behind them. Don't pray behind them. Because that Imam is doing something of shirk and kufr. Shirk and kufr. Now, our relatives who are brewies, 
the regular relative who believes in this nonsense. You go to his house and it's time for salah. Do you pray behind him? I say pray behind him. He's ignorant. He doesn't know. He's jahil. He doesn't know his religion. Just like the Shi'i, Shi'ite person who curses the companions. He just thinks that is the religion. He doesn't know. So pray behind them in their homes. Don't make a big stink about it and a big deal. I have to pray. I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. As for the janazah that takes place and your uncle is going to be buried and the janazah is going to be prayed in their masjid, if you can stand strong and not pray behind them, then do it. Don't pray behind them and don't just obey Allah because of the creation. But if it's going to be too much stress on you, it's going to be too much fitna on you, it's going to be too much problems on you, then you have to get knowledge from someone who is higher than you. Tell them your situation. Should you go and do it out of necessity or not do it? But generally speaking, don't pray in those messages. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Uh, another thing is, I'm not saying that because this is like a football game. Hmm? Birmingham City, they're Birmingham City, and we're Aston. So we don't want to pray with them. No, I'm not saying that for that. This is our religion. This is our religion. The religion necessitates that you not make salat behind people who this is their situation. When they are leaders of that dalala and that dawah, and they know what they're doing and talking about. As for the regular people, then it's a different story, inshallah. Aywa, any more questions, Ikhwan? Little man, Yusuf. Oh, you're not Yusuf. What's your name again, boy? Abdul Ahad. Abdul Ahad. Fadda. It's a nice name. When you said that... Uh we're not allowed to pray behind graves. How if the Qibla is facing where the graves are? Uh, no doubt about it. You can rest assured, Abdul Ahad, that there are some graves between us and the Qibla. From here to Mecca, there are a lot of graves between us and the Qibla. So that's part of the meaning of the ayat. فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Wherever you turn, there is the face of Allah. We don't have anything to do with those graves being in front of us. We don't even know about them. And they're not our goal, and they're not our intention. So, no problem. No problem at all. As for the masjid that has a grave inside of it, then don't pray in that masjid at all. Don't pray in it at all. But what about the Prophet's masjid that has a grave in it? Okay. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First of all, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ nasiya. Your Lord wasn't forgetful. Allah knew in the future there was going to be a grave in that masjid. And yet, He allowed us when we travel, that's one of the messages we can travel to. So Allah allowed us. Number two, that grave was not always in the masjid. Sallallahu alayhi wa grave was introduced after the death of the Nabi, at the end of the time of the companions. And the companions, they said, don't do it. And they advised the leader. The tabi'een, they said, don't do it. And they advised the leader. But the leader decided to do his own thing. And the Muslims just had to listen. They just had to listen. Okay, this will be the last question, inshallah. The second question for Abu Ibrahim. Um, he mentions in that video of Tawassul, and he is seeking the means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he kind of uses this as a delay to say that they seek this means by means of the Prophet, even after his death. And he. The, the hadith of the blind man who came to the messenger Allah, he said, so how do we concerning the tawassul a tawassul or taking an intermediary between you and Allah can only be made by making a tawassul with your good deeds oh Allah I don't like praying in this masjid for one reason or another it's not my favorite masjid because the people are opposed to the sunnah the recitation of the Imam is a problem. There's something going on. But oh Allah, I only keep coming to this masjid because <coughs> I believe it's wajib. Because I'm being patient, give me this and give me that. You make to us by your deeds. So don't minimize the deeds that you do. Something you're doing that you don't like doing it, just keep doing it and be patient because you've been told to do it and make a tawassu. Oh Allah. You know I don't like this, you know I don't like that, but I do this and I do that. Because of that, please give me this, please give me that. You can make a torso 
by the asma of Allah, his names and his attributes. Allah, you are Rahman Rahim, forgive me. Allah, you this, you're the Raza, little quwwat al mateen, give me a child, give me money, this, that, that, that. And you can make a tawassal by asking someone who's living, can you make dua for me? Other than that, you can't make any tawassal. As for the blind man who came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I want to do this and I want you to do that. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, okay, make this dua. So the dua that he made was asking Allah by the jah of Rasulullah to give him this and give him that. First of all, that man came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he was able to do that, he could have just stayed in his house and did it from over there. Just stay in your house. You don't have to come. But he came to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if he came to the Rasul, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was what? He was what? Alive. He was living. He was alive. Second of all, after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, none of his companions did that. You think if that was good, they would have known that this is something we can do. Let's just go to his grave and make a tawassal. No. During the era and the khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu, there was a drought, a bad drought, a serious drought. It was so bad that a man stole something, a horse. He stole a big thing, a camel. And it was enough to get his hand chopped off. Umar said, no, we're not going to chop his hand off because the situation, the drought, compelled him to do it. So he didn't establish the hajj. Because of the circumstances. It was that bad. So they wanted to make an istisqa, the salat asking for rain. Umar radiallahu anhu was the best human being on the face of the earth at that moment. But what did he do? He went and he said to the uncle of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abbas, we want you to lead the salat. You lead the salat because of your position with Rasulullah. The Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al am bi manzilat al ab. Your father's brother is like the father the father's brother is like the father so Abbas is the brother of Rasulullah's father وسلم, so he's like Rasulullah's father everyone knows Abbas's relationship and position with the Nabi he's an older statesman of the community although he's not better than Umar he's not better than Uthman he's not better than Ali he's not better than Abdurrahman ibn Auf he's not better than those other six people promised Jannah but he was like the father of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he made the salat, and that was a tawassal with the righteous man, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. As for making dua to the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah is free from them. He told his uncle, that's a phone or the other hand? Phone. He told his uncle, oh, Uncle Abbas, ask for my money, what you want. I can't help you with Allah. Oh, Sophia, auntie of Rasulullah, ask for my money, what you want. I can't help you with Allah. Oh, Fatima, daughter of Rasulullah, ask for my money. I'll give you what you want, but I can't help you with Allah. He told that to the closest people to him. I can't help you with Allah. The only way I can help you is if you follow my sunnah. The only way I can help you is if I make shifa for you, Yom al Qiyam, intercession because you deserve it and Allah is pleased to give it to you and gives a permission. As for me being in between you and Allah, Yom al Qiyam, I couldn't help my mother, I couldn't help my father, I couldn't help Abu Lahab, I couldn't help Abu Jahl, I can't help you. So, ikhwati fillah, connect yourselves to Allah Azza wa and plant the seed of a tawheed in the hearts and the minds of your children. If your child knows Allah, he'll know himself. People won't be able to tell the child, you can't be, you can't do this. You can't become a doctor, for an example. You can't do this, you can't do that. You won't be successful. The child says, no, I know Allah. I can do whatever I want to do. That is ma'qul. And he also won't be a person who's arrogant because he knows that Allah is akbar and Allah is a'zam and Allah is kabir and Allah is a qawi. So he knows himself. He's not going to be arrogant. He's going to exist between those two extremes. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته